colleagues and friends, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and I am happy to welcome all of you. Uh, I am Director of Institute of uh, Latvian Institute of International Affairs, also Professor at Trigis Radic University. And of course, uh, once more welcoming participants and those who follow us on Facebook, on online. Uh, so this is a concluding event of the year, of the world year in many countries. Uh, then the important topic of uh, high threats and small democracies. Uh, uh, the discussion uh, what we have today this morning intends to provide a comparative analysis and paying a particular attention to experiences of the Baltic countries and Taiwan. And of course, we are also glad in this endeavor to cooperate with Taipei Mission in Latvia. This is a joint uh, effort to identify both risks and lessons for small democracies. Uh, hybrid threats, hybrid warfare, hybridity are rather recent uh, concepts, uh, but have gained both uh, intellectual and political traction. Uh, these remain multidimensional and rather controversial concepts as well. There is also a distinction between hybrid warfare and hybrid interference. But in general, if we have to define hybrid threats, threaten political, ideological, cultural, psychological pillars of societies. Uh, they may attack those threats, all kinds of ambiguities, and may also lead as a very end to erosion of stability. Uh, specific context also may make hybrid threats more challenging. Uh, democracies are more open by definition, as we may know. And because we are more open, we are also more exposed. Uh, so there are societal diversities and cleavages already existing within societies, within states. And uh, so, of course, it uh, creates some risks as well. Uh, interdependence also could be weaponized. And, and as a small democracies are both open and in interdependent, there are risks of vulnerabilities. So we face quite a spectrum of different challenges, different risks, but at the same time, there are also opportunities for cooperation. So what are uh, those vulnerabilities small democracies uh, facing? Uh, how we can address them? Uh, what are the best practices and lessons we can learn uh, and apply to make our societies more resilient? So these are all questions we are willing to discuss uh, today in, as I mentioned, in this joint effort by Latvian Institute of International Personnel, also by Taipei Mission in Latvia. Uh, so, and to address those issues, we have an excellent panel of distinguished international speakers. And uh, we start with member of the parliament, Mr. Einar Slatkovskis, uh, who is the head of the Strategic Communications Subcommittee at the Latvian Parliament. Strategic communication, of course, is as well very important in dealing with those uh, hybrid threats and hybrid challenges our societies are facing. So, Mr. Latkovsky, the floor is yours, please. So I think your mic is switched off at the moment. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Scrooge, for introducing me. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that we all can agree that today's international security environment looks kind and certain and volatile. It's not only in our region, uh, but it's all over the world. Cyber attacks, propaganda, disinformation, and other hybrid threats are the new challenges our societies have to deal with. Information warfare, and it's recognized by many researchers, is actually one of the key components of our big neighbors hybrid warfare strategy. Our society, and not only our society, I would say the societies of three Baltic states, are extensively exposed to Moscow's disinformation activities that are designed to create a favorable environment for Russian policies and politics. That's why two years ago, Latvian parliament 
accepted my proposal of creating special subcommittee on strategic communication. For two years, our committee, which uh, consists of members of parliaments from all fractions, meet two times a month. We discuss different subjects, but our main goal is actually uh, find the changes needed in legislation to improve strategic communication or give the tools to our uh, governmental institutions to fight uh, this information. Uh, more or less, uh, um, we have uh, reached some agreement among all governmental institutions that strategic communication requires uh, concrete cooperation. You cannot do it alone or do it only in the defense department and, or do it in the prime minister's office or uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, ministry. It's the job where all institutions have to in, be involved. That's probably one of the lessons we have learned during these two years working in subcommittee and having discussions among politicians, researchers, uh, representatives from NGOs. I would like to talk more, but because right now we have an uh, extensive agenda in our parliament and we have plenary session, I'll have to leave you and you will discuss this very important subject uh, for our two societies, Latvian and Taiwanese, and wish you all the best and productive discussions. And also, not so far, there is New Year. So hopefully, and this is safe for probably the first time in my life, this shitty year ends and the new one <laughs> starts. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me to say some words. And, and uh, thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Lodkowski, for a concise uh, but targeted uh, introduction and also for the description of this year. Uh, I think we are all a little bit already fatigued by, by, by this year and of course we hope that we'll be able to uh, meet and discuss those things also in person in the future. But so far, of course, also use opportunities and advantages of online communication as well and interdependence as well. But you indicated in your short uh, speech uh, quite a number of important points. I hope we will be able also to discuss a bit. Of course, uh, one of the hybrid threats uh, is uh, disinformation, especially also in the context of COVID. We see it, uh, we see it internally and also externally generated. At the same time, you also mentioned, of course, that there are some um, countermeasures. There are also some instruments, some tools at disposal of small democracies uh, how also to fight this information. And strategic communication is one of them. And of course, also importance of partnerships, uh, importance of internal partnerships, namely the involving all stakeholders, the society, the governmental institutions, uh, NGOs, of course. Uh, so uh, there is also the spectrum of uh, stakeholders who can uh, address and deal and cooperate in addressing those uh, hybrid uh, threats. And of course, also international partnerships. So when this event is um, uh, sort of uh, leaning and inclining and uh, intending also to, to, to uh, sort of to message in this direction that uh, international partnerships, also small democracies uh, is, uh, are important. Uh, but anyway, uh, I am cutting short my own uh, concise uh, remarks on concise remarks by Einar uh, Lotkowskis, uh, who is the head of Subcommittee for Strategic Communication for Latvian Parliament. And I'm happy to give the floor to Una uh, Alexandra Berznia Cherenkova, uh, senior fellow and head uh, of the New Silk Road program at, Latvi at Latvian Institute of International Affairs, also the Chinese Studies Center at Riga Strategic University. Una, you've been observing those developments uh, 
in um, Asia, in China, in also, of course, in this uh, hybrid domain as well for years. So please, the floor is yours to, to lead the discussion with our distinguished uh, participants. Luna, please, the floor is yours. And thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor, for giving us this um, outline and uh, and uh, indeed uh, explaining what uh, where does the hybridity lie. Uh, and now I would like to um, take it one step uh, further and operationalize the concept uh, in the sense that this way that, that 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 we can work around it and see uh, where the commonalities lie, where the challenges lie, and what lessons can be learned. So. Um, when we, uh, indeed we have studied uh, uh, hybridity and hybrid threats quite a lot, obviously we understand that this is a concept that not everybody is comfortable with. In your speech, you mentioned that it is a new phenomenon. Uh, almost on every hybrid event, we have a question saying nothing is new under the sun. This, this, these tactics have been around since uh, since ancient Greece. But of course, we understand that a very important element comes in, and that is the cyber element. That makes it interesting, that makes it new, and that is also something that you mentioned. So this information becomes uh, much more potent when people feel like they have the agency and a stake in distributing um, the information that they see fit. So let me uh, once again operationalize the concept of hybridity the way we see it today. Um, first of all, it is something that is centralized. It is performed by or on behalf of a government actor or its proxy. Uh, obviously, not every one of these uh, points have to, uh, you know, it's uh, not every box has to be ticked, but we see in our everyday work that a lot of these boxes are normally ticked. Number two, it's a permanent activity. It can be traced for a certain period of time. It is also a reoccurring activity. There is a cyclicity to it, right? So maybe it's around the elections. Maybe it's around some uh, um, particular um, uh, commemoration dates, for example, but it is something that is cyclical. Of course, quite clearly, it is a harmful activity. And just like you already pointed out, it is aimed at destabilizing the social structure uh, and political processes of the target society. It is also a very precise tool. It is kind of a surgical tool rather than carpet bombing. Uh, it is uh, designed to exploit uh, precise vulnerabilities of the targeted society. Um, and uh, in our case, for example, we uh, as a multi-ethnic society, we see that that is the vulnerability, or I rather believe that it is a strength, but we can see that this is something that is being exploited um, in these hybrid activities. Uh, it is also a comprehensive activity in the sense that it deploys several mutually um, strengthening tactics across the board simultaneously. Um, and to quote um, um, a report on hybrid threats uh, published in Helsinki by the Helsinki uh, Hybrid Center of Excellence, it is from threats of war to propaganda and everything in between. So it is really hard to just put a ping finger on. And then, um, it, of course, these activities tend to be under the radar because the one of the main principles of hybrid attacks is not to... Uh, not to trigger the not to trigger the tripwire action, not to um, not to punch above the threshold of something that is considered to be an attack. Obviously, the difficulty to attribute such attacks and such activities is also one of the key characteristics of hybrid. And as they are hard to attribute, they also possess very high deniability, something that we see a lot in our countries and in our societies. Um, from coming obviously from Russia is basically saying this wasn't us, right? This is uh, uh, this has nothing to do with us. Um, and but the main and underlying um, aspect of hybridity is the fact that it is indeed cyber. It involves high tech information technologies. Uh, it um, it uses our uh, especially now during the pandemic. It uses our um, reliance. Uh, on um, on technology. So with these um, with these kind of um, with this framework in mind, uh, clearly we see that um, hybridity has also become a very uh, pressing issue on the EU agenda. Um, and um, 
the Baltics being the uh, being very um, integrated European Union member states, uh, we see that this also has um, um, will will have an effect on the way we see hybridity in the new European Union cybersecurity strategy, for example. Uh, a no tolerance principle has been proclaimed towards quote cyber activities, notably those affecting our democratic institutions and processes. So indeed, cyber activities have the potential to shake societies. Now, um, to my uh, to our guests, and uh, we have um, um, Assistant Professor uh, Vida Machkianaita from uh, uh, who uh, uh, teaches at the International Relations Program Graduate School of International Relations at the International University of Japan and is coming to us live from Vilnius. Uh, and she will be speaking on the Lithuanian um, uh, on the Lithuanian examples. Please, Vida, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. I was still listening to you. That that came rather unexpectedly. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies. <laughs> thank you for the for the introduction as well. That's definitely my pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Well, I have a very very general probably overview of what. Um, of what the situation is in Lithuania. If you don't mind, let me share some some slides. Um, uh, just a second. Yes, uh, I'm not sure I can I can share. Probably probably have to be allowed to share, isn't it? Uh, OK, well, then I will not share my 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 oh, no, no. Isn't Vida, we will we will just we will solve it we will show, solve it in a second. We are very much excited to see your your slides, and we don't want to let your work go to waste. Just let me quickly ask my colleague Cynthia Broca, dear Cynthia, um, is is it possible for us to turn on the sharing privileges for uh, Professor Machkenaite? Nick, can you turn on the sharing options, please? Thank you. And I'm sure Michael will down the road. You will also probably be needing this, right? So maybe we can just go ahead. No, OK, OK, so just be there then. <laughs> OK, then well, it's it's nothing probably that much to show. It's just a couple of um, a, a couple of graphs with the data that I'd like to share. But OK, let me just start without it and then I'll see if I can use it. Uh, so, well, basically just talking about the, the hybrid th threats in Lithuania, I have to say that, well, since uh, for the past few years, uh, uh, for the past few years, we have had already regular assessment uh, conducted by, uh, by the state security department of the Republic of Lithuania. And that indeed has been very helpful in the sense that they would they would provide and list out all the trends and they they would point to the exact threats that we are facing in Lithuania, right? And that has been has been considered to be like, well, a very important thing to do just to well to keep following up what's what's going on, kind of monitoring what's what's going on. And the trends have been, well, they have been changing. And on the one hand, the trends of these hybrid th threats in Lithuania have been, well, the old threats remained and the new ones emerged. And when I speak about the new ones, I would say that uh, it's also somehow in the uh, recent reports in what well, last year, this year, the well, a new source of threat, China, has emerged, has been mentioned. And before that, we only had China, sorry, we only had Russia as the major well, source of threat. And it still, well, it still remains as the major, uh, as the major issue in, in Lithuania, I would say. And uh, well, we are talking about as a source of threat or who would be posing the threats. We are talking or who would be sorry, who would be conducting uh, certain attacks. We are talking about both government and non-governmental structures. And that usually happens well with support. It's expected or is said to be happened with the support of political authorities. And the targets, well, Una, you mentioned that it's it's mainly this like cyber element. But at least the way it is defined by Lithuanian, uh, well, in Lithuanian, by Lithuanian State Security Department, they also include in this hybrid warfare not only the um, not only the the cyberspace, but also well, energy uh, energy security, and also information security through other channels, which would not necessarily go through uh, uh, through internet, but well, 
I will I will be speaking about it in a moment through television and well just mass information um, channels. And well, cyber attacks, when it comes to specifically to cyber attacks, we have definitely seen a huge number, well, an increase, a very significant increase in, in the number of incidents. And the aim is very kind of straightforward, like, well, just to interfere with information and infrastructures in Lithuania, which would be relevant to, to national security and also obtains well, some information from Lithuania. And there is another kind of well, another element in this that it would be very strongly aimed. Those cyber attacks, they would be very strongly aimed at uh, disseminating some fake or alternative news in Lithuania. And what specifically, like what aims specifically, we could be talking about? Um, so it would, it's it could be well something that is called in the in the secure in the threat assessment report what is called like strengthening the ideology of cynicism, kind of like among the Lithuanian population. Uh, also polluting information field of the state. And very often these would be like, well, attempts to distort Lithuanian historical memory, some facts, specific historic facts that would be associated with Lithuanian statehood. Uh, also weaken the national identity, like public spirit. And also it is well, it is pointed out by the security department that the, the these attacks are very much aimed at the well aimed at uh, like weakening the desire of the citizens to protect their state. Uh, next, um, <coughs> excuse me. Next, it's also uh, aimed very often like the information campaign that we would see in Lithuania from other well from the outside or through the cyber attacks. These could be aimed at developing mistrust in state institutions, also military forces. And what's very interesting, it happens well from time to time, and I would say pretty commonly, that they would be aimed at discrediting EU and NATO. So it's like, well, the Western, the Western side, <clears throat> the Western institutions, which those, um, which uh, those cyber attacks would be trying to uh, well to undermine kind of the image of those institutions. And well, just a moment. I'm still trying to share, but it's somehow not working. But okay, let me let me just continue this way. <coughs> Excuse me. And then one of like Fiorita, well, the maybe you could uh, just quickly forward your slides to uh, Cynthia, and maybe Cynthia can can as 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 the Oh no, you're also the guest. Maybe the administrator could share because it would be a shame if if we let if we let the slides go to waste. That's, yeah, that's it's just that's technical okay. matter. Uh, Nix is telling me that you have to ask permission to share the slides, and he will confirm. If you can see the option on your screen somewhere in the system. No, not really. I guess this is because I am the guest. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so please move your please move your um, mouse around around the around the screen a little bit, and you will see this floating window come up. The one the same one where you mute and unmute your microphone. Yeah, yeah. there's and open share tray, and probably it's somewhere there. Um, yeah, it's just open open and close, and then it's empty. Maybe I should it. have put it here. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, that's that's okay. I mean. That's not that much to, to show, so sorry. So the, sorry for the issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we are talking about this, like, well, the the goals of the uh, the aims of this information uh, information warfare, uh, some of the examples are like, for example, constant efforts to, like I mentioned, constant well efforts to distort Lithuanian historical memory or the facts will. Some, somehow associated with very important for Lithuanian independence, for example. And one of the cases is, as you may know, in 1991, uh, there was a uh, there was an incident with the so-called January 1999 events in Lithuania when, well, Soviet still, uh, tanks uh, came to Vilnius and large large numbers of lithuanians large groups of lithuanians gathered at the at the parliament of lithuania basically to depend uh, to depend Lithu sorry to defend lithuania and there have been trials going on in lithuania uh, to 
uh, well, basically to convict those in charge of those uh, violent events where 14 people died, 14 Lithuanians died, uh, well, to persecute them uh, for, for the crimes they have committed. And these are basically the crimes against humanity. And what we have seen, what we have seen in the information information campaign, well, which is which is targeting very much this uh, this situation, the information campaign from the outside from Russia has been to well an attempt to basically convince domestic in Russia and foreign audiences like in Lithuania and elsewhere that those convicted convicted of the crimes in January 1991 events in Lithuania were basically, well, are basically uh, unduly prosecuted political prisoners. And that's that's one of the cases where we really see this very, well, very strong information campaign coming from Russia. Um, then how how is this, well, well, in this case and in other cases with, with different aims I have mentioned, how are those, uh, those whole goals uh, pursued? So basically in Lithuania we have seen uh, television playing a very significant role and there has been data collected by by Lithuanian radio and television commission how much of Russian production appears on uh, Lithuanian television and this was done upon the request from a parliament member Lithuanian parliament member back in 2016 and indeed the data the data show that some channels show a huge amount of Russian production some of the some of the TV channels actually back in 2017 were showing as much as 44 percent of uh, of Russian production on their like Lithuanian channels. Others were showing like nearly 50 percent. And the good trend is that this has changed. And what we see already in 2019 that even the channels who were that that were showing like well up to like even more than 40 percent of Russian production their contents, Russian contents, has decreased to, well, to a few percent only, which is, which is a remarkable trend, which means that, well, this information campaign, at least on the television, uh, the Lithuanian government has been able to control it. And how have we been able to control it? Well, on, one, on the one hand, there has been information campaign, definitely. The channels have been, TV channels have been very much discussed in the public sphere, and kind of, well, in a way, um, awareness campaign, kind of, right? And on the other hand, there has been the, um, the review of the, on the law of the provision of information to the public, which has explicitly stated that 90% of all the information on Lithuanian TV channels has to be on, in languages, in official uh, uh, EU languages which, well, Russian is not is not an official language of the EU, and that automatically puts the limits to the contents of uh, Russian contents in, in um, Lithuanian TV channels. So this was one, well, one channel how, how this uh, information warfare, uh, warfare was uh, conducted, and we somehow, like, Lithuania somehow managed to put this under control. Uh, another important thing is that uh, Russia is said to have, well, to, to try to influence ethnic minorities in Lithuania through this information campaign. We don't have such a huge, significant pro-Russian, probably, um, ethnic population, but still that's, well, um, that's a that, that is, well, that is a, a proportion of the, of the population, right? And the important thing is that, that's what I, well, the data I wanted to share, but that's okay, just let me summarize it, that uh, there was a survey uh, on uh, how often do you watch, well, different TV channels in Lithuania. And interestingly enough, Russian and Polish populations in Lithuania would be mainly relying on Russian TV stations for the, well, for the, for the news and, and information they receive, which then makes them a very, well, vulnerable in a way. Uh, part of the society in this, in this, uh, if, when we are talking about information warfare as a hybrid threat, and then, uh, well, like I said, TV, TV is probably something like Una said, something that has been around for quite a while, um, for well, for decades, 
but then now it with the well with the advancement of technology definitely we have other other channels where hybrid th threats come from and these are mainly cyber attacks and what we have seen in lithuania is the placement of fake news articles on lithuanian websites and these could be official websites of state institutions or even news outlets when a cyber attack would be uh, conducted and then well we would see as a result some like unfamiliar some um, well kind of alien in a way article uh, posted on the website and the most recent the most recent example of this although we really have numerous numerous cases like this annually uh, the most recent attack was well the report about it was in just a week ago basically uh, last week on the 10th of December uh, when it was uh, when there was an article posted about uh, basically like well uh, about a Polish ambassador uh, being detained uh, detained at the border carrying weapons, drugs, and money. That's well, this is pretty kind of extreme. And that's what the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have stated that recently we have seen we have seen uh, well an increase in the number of such attacks which are seeking to undermine friendly Lithuanian Polish relations. And that's that's a significant that's a very significant issue in Lithuanian foreign policy. And that indeed affects the regional environment very much and Lithuania security too. Uh, at the same time, like that was a complex cyber attack. And at the same time, there was also a fake news uh, put on uh, on the website of, of one of the municipalities about an airport where NATO's uh, NATO's mission is stationed. So that's that's like well a complex complex and well targeted indeed and constantly occurring reoccurring uh, information warfare that we see through these cyber attacks. And then well the final one well sometimes we would have like so-called spoofed emails when again fake information is delivered to state institutions but that's well that's yet uh, another uh, another angle probably of, of information warfare. And the other thing, well, the final thing actually, is the so-called energy security, which Lithuanian State Security Department often, well, continuously is pointing to, that r from, from the Russian side, there is obviously an attempt to, well, to interfere with Lithuania's energy independence. But of course, this is well. This is apart from the hybrid threats we are talking about in cyberspace. But well, again, for Lithuania, this is a very, very significant, uh, significant element. So that that would be it from me. I'm sorry, I just wasn't able to share it. But well, I hope I I was able to make my point anyway. Thank, thank you, you very dear, much. Thank you, dear Vida. We know that if something can go on, can go wrong online, it definitely will. And thank you very much for working around this issue. And I'm sure that we that you provided a very comprehensive um, outline. So uh, first of all, I would like to say that um, the most recent example that, uh, of, of, of hybrid uh, threats, hybrid warfare that, that, that you just described basically speaks to the point of Prof Professor Sprutz, basically that STRATCOM is a very efficient countermeasure to these issues uh, because the moment these attacks happen, and I think Lithuania has been doing this uh, for quite some years now, you have a very coordinated STRATCOM effort and the way you handled uh, th this uh, particular outbreak also was was spoke to this uh, to this coordination in terms of stratcom so i think it is with all its tragic tragedy it's also a a very good example let's say uh, now my question to you just one is you outlined China as a, as a kind of as a disruptor, as, a, as, as an actor that's coming in now, right? It's also quite similar across the Baltics. You outlined Russia's classic, traditional, let's say, uh, um, approach to, to, to hybrid in Lithuania. The, the question, the million dollar question is, is there confluence? Do you see these two actors acting in concert or mutually enhancing each other's agendas, or maybe there's no such thing? Well, I would personally say that, well, definitely that's a $1 million question. Like that's that's what we would, in a long term, we would find out. Uh, 
But I would say that at the moment, there, these are probably two different agendas, and I, I wouldn't see how those would be would be related because also it's noted also in the security, like in the threat assessment reports, that China has a very specific agenda, which is aimed at its own well, its own political purposes, such as well, recognition of Taiwan. Uh, well, non-recognition, kind of like one China policy, um, human rights issues in China, so that they wouldn't be escalated, they wouldn't be debated at the well, at the in the public sphere of the country. While Russia has seems to be having a totally different agenda, and the the actions they take, these seems to be like seem to be absolutely separate, like two things apart, at least for the time being. Thank you very much, Vida. And now you already mentioned Taiwan, and so we give the floor to J. Michael Cole, Senior Fellow at McDonald Laurel Institute, Senior Fellow at Global Taiwan Institute, and also Senior Fellow at Taiwan Studies Program at the University of Nottingham, UK, Associate Researcher at the French Center for Research of Con on Contemporary China, um, an author who has written about uh, China's, um, uh, it's for, so the recent book is called Insidious Power, How China Undermines Global Democracy, and also has been researching cross-strait relations. So, uh, Michael, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Greetings from uh, from Taiwan. Uh, I have to po apologize from the outset for my voice. We're having uh, bad air in northern Taiwan today, so I'm having slight allergies. But we should be okay. And as a former government employee, I absolutely abhor uh, PowerPoint presentations. Uh, so that explains why I do not have uh, have slides today. But so we're not going to have that technical issue. Uh, well, anyway, so thank you very much to the Institute and the Taiwan Representative Office in Latvia for inviting me to talk on a subject that is very close to my heart. Uh, I would just uh, point out from the outset, I think it's important to highlight the fact that while Taiwan is obviously uh, comparatively smaller to China, if you look at uh, than China, if we look at the world map, uh, I would nevertheless say that it falls in the category of a medium power rather than a small power. Uh, it has a population of 23.8 million people, so that's the equivalent of that in Australia, for example, uh, and it does rank among the 20 largest economies worldwide. So it does, you know, it does does pack a punch, if you will. Um, now. Uh, there's no doubt that China, uh, we're talking about China and Russia today, uh, when we look at Taiwan security and hybrid uh, warfare, obviously the elephant in the room is China much more than Russia. So my talk uh, as a result focuses on Chinese hybrid warfare uh, aimed at Taiwan. Uh, in doing so, China is uh, blurring the lines between war and peace. Uh, which, uh, interestingly, is a subtitle to a recent book titled The Russian Understanding of War, uh, written by Oscar Johnson, who was a security expert in Sweden. Uh, and I would argue that many of the lessons uh, from Russia, the Russian example apply to China's approach uh, to hybrid warfare. Uh, that being said, that does not mean that while China certainly learns uh, from Russia, uh, that does not mean that it is copying or emulating the Russian experience when it comes to waging a hybrid warfare against different targets, particularly against against Taiwan. Um, you know, Beijing's overarching goal in all this uh, in the Taiwan Strait is the unification of Taiwan under what it calls the One China Principle. Uh, in other words, the main driver for its hybrid warfare activities is the annexation of Taiwan. Uh, and I would argue that everything else uh, for Beijing is secondary. A uh, related goal is to negate the value of Taiwan as a frontline a front democratic state uh, in China's intensifying ideological war with the West. And I would say that is akin to, say, Moldova or Ukraine and Baltic states when it comes to Russia's conflict with the West. Uh, taking over Taiwan, finally, is also related to China's efforts to expel the United States uh, from the Indo-Pacific. So China uses, uh, and here I use a uh, enlarged definition of hybrid warfare. Uh, so it's a mix of traditional warfare, non-traditional warfare, and certainly a cyber component. Uh, so China uses hybrid warfare for uh, different purposes, uh, including inducements, uh, co-optation, uh, psychological warfare, 
uh, to confuse society in Taiwan, to divide and polarize uh, or exacerbate uh, variables that contribute to the polarization, uh, as well as to erode democratic institutions and support thereof by the Taiwanese public. Uh, co-optation uh, of the Taiwanese military, particularly older officers who, for family reasons, may have a more intimate attachment to Taiwan, uh, to China. So, for example, they have parents or grandparents who were born in China and then fled to Taiwan following the conclusion of a civil war uh, in 1949. Uh, those individuals are oftentimes uh, targeted by Chinese intelligence uh, to collect intelligence but also through revelations of espionage to undermine support uh, for as well as confidence in the military uh, with society and government institutions in Taiwan. Uh, the aim of Chinese psychological warfare campaign against Taiwan is to sustain the notion of historical inevitability, uh, as well as to cultivate the belief that resistance to Beijing is futile. Uh, I would note, however, that much of the propaganda that we hear on a daily basis uh, is easily identified by the Taiwanese public. Uh, and I would argue that much of that is directed at a domestic audience in China uh, to bolster support for the Chinese Communist Party. The threat is no doubt sustained. It's multifaceted and it's ever adapting. Uh, it involves a constellation of actors. So United Front War Department, the People's Liberation Army, uh, Ministry of State Security, uh, the State Council's Taiwan Affairs Office, then you have universities, you have think tanks, you have cultural exchanges, media, uh, non-governmental organizations, civic groups, uh, business uh, circles, as well as crime syndicates. All of these are part of the constellation that wages hybrid warfare against Taiwan. Uh, what we have observed is there's a mix of centralized that is directly orchestrated by the CCP, uh, hybrid efforts, as well as what I would term freelancing, uh, and those are non-government uh, Chinese ultra-nationalists who are acting independently uh, out of what they regard as their responsibility uh, for the mainland, or the motherland, uh, that is China. That uh, campaign is waged on a global scale, uh, with Chinese Communist Party officials and their proxies contributing to the ceaseless harassment of Taiwanese abroad. Uh, that includes on university campuses. Uh, as well as efforts to exclude uh, Taiwan from international organizations like the United Nations. Uh, the CCP also uses co-optation uh, and the lure of its economy to encourage other countries, as well as institutions, to avoid engagement with Taiwan and in doing so to exacerbate Taiwan's sense of isolation uh, on the uh, international stage. Pro-CCP organized crime and affiliates within civil society uh, are also heavily involved in threats and assault against Hong Kong pro-democracy activists uh, in Taiwan, uh, as well as Falun Gong practitioners uh, who currently live here in Taiwan. Um, in that constellation that I was referring to earlier, many are what we would call front organizations. Uh, so the challenge oftentimes is that we need to peel off the onion to see the principal actors and connection uh, to United Front Work Department, the PLA, uh, the intelligence apparatus, and, and all that. Uh, the threat to Taiwan uh, of hybrid warfare is both external, that is, it comes from China, and it's also domestic in that there is a number of enablers in Taiwanese society who are also playing an active role uh, in Chinese political warfare or hybrid warfare against Taiwan. Uh, there are then two types of enablers. There are what I would call the CCP proxies in the media. Uh, for example, co-opted politicians, business, uh, NGOs, organized crime, uh, pro-unification political parties and all that. And then the other type is the what I would call bandwagon politicians who facilitate Chinese political warfare, not because they necessarily believe in or support CCP aims, uh, but rather they do so to achieve their own domestic political objectives as members of the opposition. So anything that makes the ruling government look bad, they will utilize that uh, to achieve their own uh, domestic objectives. China also certainly benefited from eight years uh, between 2008 and 2016 of rapprochement between uh, Taiwan and China under President Ma ying or the Kuomintang, uh, which made it possible for a number of Chinese organizations to establish physically a presence in Taiwan 
uh, and to deepen exchanges with various sectors of Taiwanese society. Uh, during those eight years, this was not accompanied uh, by a commensurate expansion in counterintelligence capabilities uh, in the Taiwanese government. Certainly, hybrid warfare flares up in the lead up and during uh, elections in Taiwan. So again, money flows, underground gambling, disinformation, cyber, uh, bots, sock puppets, uh, co-optation, intimidation, use of ethnic Chinese outside China and Taiwan, uh, particularly in, in countries like Malaysia, uh, that have large uh, uh, populations of ethnic Chinese uh, and uh, at least three major families in Malaysia that have uh, substantial business uh, operations in China. So they have incentives to contribute to Chinese hybrid warfare uh, targeting Taiwan, even though they have nothing to do directly with uh, Taiwanese politics. Uh, China uh, has used uh, exploited uh, contradictions uh, in Taiwanese society, uh, social polarization on various issues such as legalization of same-sex marriage, uh, pension reform, the impact of globalization, widening wealth gap, a growing resentment toward the elite and mainstream political parties. Uh, so in other words, uh, very much what we have seen in the United States with what we could call the Trump phenomenon. Uh, and we saw this here in Taiwan with the emergence of Han Wu wave and Han Wu was the challenger to President Tsai Ing-wen in the elections in, in, in January. So these issues present openings for exploitation by the Chinese Communist Party to exacerbate divisions, as well as inject disinformation in the Taiwanese environment. Uh, hybrid warfare is comprehensive, covers a full spectrum, so from peaceful unification, so incentives and carrots, if you will, uh, to coercive, uh, as well as the outright threat of military invasion, uh, which, particularly in 2020, has become more prevalent uh, with almost daily intrusions by Chinese aircraft and vessels uh, in Taiwan's ADIZ, as well as the tacit median line uh, in the Taiwan Strait. China has weaponized trade and tourism to reward municipalities in Taiwan that are governed by more pro-CCP mayors uh, and to punish those that are governed by the ruling uh, DPP. So this is another attempt to fragment uh, Taiwanese society and to cause divisions between the central government uh, and local governments. Uh, all these instruments that I've mentioned are not mutually exclusive uh, or in the CCPIs even contradictory. Instead, they are all deployed simultaneously. Cyber attacks, meanwhile, are sustained. Uh, they come both from the PLA and civilian sector. Uh, they are state-initiated and they are self-initiated. Uh, the targets in Taiwan are government institutions, political parties, the military, uh, as well as the high-tech sector, particularly uh, the chip, microchip uh, manufacturers. Uh, Taiwan is the target of a staggering 20 to 40 million hacking attempts against its public sector every month. Uh, and hacking groups linked to the Chinese government have attacked at least 10 government agencies and some 6,000 email accounts of government officials in an infiltration attempt to steal important data. That particular operation is believed to have begun sometime in 2018. Uh, so it's difficult to evaluate the success of hybrid warfare against Taiwan. On the one hand, it certainly has contributed to polarization, especially around election time, but it has also backfired and contributed to a deepening desire to defend democracy in Taiwan uh, and contributed to opposition to unification with China, especially on, on Beijing's terms. Uh, funding for proxy agencies uh, is also difficult, difficult to trace. Uh, China has used indirect routes, particularly uh, organizations and businesses registered in Hong Kong, um, and those are used to mask the origin of CCP uh, money. Uh, they also rely on recycling of legitimate business operations in China to fund gray zone activities in Taiwan, uh, as well as the proceeds from criminal activities that are used to finance pro-CCP political work in Taiwan. Um, the challenge is immense because about 40% of Taiwanese exports go to China, uh, exports, uh, and China is Taiwan's largest trading partner. Uh, the two economies are highly interdependent and more than 1 million Taiwanese, uh, known as Taishang, uh, and their dependents work and live in China, which creates tremendous opportunities for co-optation uh, and blackmail by the Chinese Communist Party. We have seen direct subsidies by the PRC government to holdings companies and the hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, companies that own uh, media conglomerates in Taiwan. 
so even though these two are separate legal entities, uh, it's difficult to imagine that these kinds of financial injections do not have an impact on the editorial line of the media controlled by the said company. And oftentimes they sound quite uh, pro-CCP. Uh, more than 70 participants from Taiwanese media, the film industry and advertisement uh, have attended uh, an annual cross street media forum in, in Beijing, uh, where they are told uh, to focus on certain areas and to say certain things uh, that promote unification in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, business people making money in China have also financed new media, uh, also content farms or content, uh, content mills, uh, spreading pro-CCP propaganda and disinformation. Uh, many have been caught by the, the government, they have shut down or they have been flagged uh, by Facebook following coordination with the Taiwanese government. Uh, so media, print, TV, radio and new media serve to legitimize uh, this and misinformation generated by CCP on social media, uh, as well as content farms and etc. Uh, the role of social media apps um, involves a new strategy uh, to, to rely on enablers uh, to shape the discourse. So oftentimes they will use a mix of truthful information and disinformation, uh, which makes it more difficult to identify. Uh, and that certainly indicates uh, that the Chinese side is adapting uh, and Taiwan faces an ever-changing uh, nature of, of the threat of disinformation. We've seen co-opted publishing companies in Taiwan that are providing revisionist textbooks that emphasize Chinese sovereignty over Taiwan. So that means they're also targeting young Taiwanese and trying to shape their perceptions, their minds. Uh, we have seen artists, uh, businesses, YouTubers that want to make money in China oftentimes will be complicit in propaganda and disinformation. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have uh, co-opted business people uh, in China serving as conduits for disinformation and division. And we have seen this repeatedly uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. Uh, efforts by Beijing to undermine support for what the Taiwanese government has been doing to successfully handle COVID-19. We've seen all expenses paid uh, visits to China for Taiwanese students, for professors and academics. Uh, this in turn creates incentives to avoid criticism of the PRC uh, and to echo uh, the CPP's position on Taiwan. That also creates opportunities for co-optation. Uh, however, again, it seems to fail in most cases, uh, so the Taiwanese are aware of, of what they're being exposed to. Uh, most of them are happy to, to have free meals and free trips, uh, but that does not mean that China successfully brainwashes the Taiwanese. Uh, and we've seen a lot of activity occurring under the guise of cultural exchanges and cross-strait forums over the years. So now, the threat is certainly asymmetrical in nature. Uh, China has much more resources than Taiwan. Uh, and also Taiwan uh, has democratic institutions, which means that it is oftentimes difficult to prosecute, uh, to find and to shut down uh, organizations and individuals who are involved in those efforts. A lot of political warfare activities are not necessarily illegal, but they're certainly unethical. So how does a democracy prosecute those? Uh, which agency in law enforcement or intelligence takes the lead when an actor engages in both criminal and political work? Uh, is support for uni unification even illegal? Uh, does it constitute treason? Can it be prosecuted? Or does this all fall under freedom of expression? These are all questions that a democratic government and society need to ask themselves. Um, so as a government uh, under Taiwan takes more action to address uh, the challenge of Chinese hybrid warfare, uh, opposition parties oftentimes uh, refer to those measures as a green terror, uh, or authoritarianism, uh, even though Taiwan has repeatedly been demonstrated to be the freest uh, and most vibrant democracy in, in, in East Asia. Uh, this occasionally results in protests and a rise of a civil society that can easily be controlled or infiltrated uh, by the CCP or proxies in organized crime. And finally, I would say that all of this is a test of resilience, uh, endurance and adaptability for Taiwan. Uh, I would say that no society today is targeted by hybrid warfare as heavily and in, in a such a sustained fashion as is Taiwan by a hostile foreign force. Uh, and mistakes for Taiwan can have existential uh, repercussions. So I'll end here and I certainly do look forward to the, uh, the discussion.
Thank you very much, Michael. A very indeed comprehensive and um, informative presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, use this opportunity and ask a question that one of our uh, uh, Facebook um, listeners uh, has has posted, and I'm going to address this question to you because, well, COVID-19 has helped Taiwan's visibility and soft power. Um, and the question is, how has the fake news hybrid attacks dynamic changed during COVID? Um, have there been more attacks? Maybe more pronounced sectors have emerged as target targets of such attacks. So if you could comment on the situation in Taiwan. Certainly, very good uh, relative and timely question. Uh, what we've seen over the years is a series of, of attempts to uh, generate disinformation on uh, pension reform, same-sex marriage, uh, food safety, uh, wealth inequality, and all that. And again, those tend to flare up in lead-ups to the elections and all that. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly presented yet another opportunity or avenue for the Chinese Communist Party uh, to target the ruling government in Taiwan and to sow divisions uh, within Taiwanese society. Uh, no doubt Beijing has realized that the Taiwanese government has reacted uh, very well to the challenge uh, of COVID-19, uh, which explains why everyday life in Taiwan is, is has been normal for several months. It's an invariable position compared to pretty much uh, the rest of the international community. Now, what we have seen, uh, returning to the topic of hybrid warfare, we have seen China using some Taiwanese business people based in China uh, to try to uh, force Taiwan to accept uh, Taiwanese returnees uh, as well as their Chinese spouses and children, for example. Uh, early on this year, we had two planes coming back from uh, from Wuhan area, uh, and when the planes landed in Taiwan, the flight manifests were not reflected by the people who were actually on board. So that created all sorts of problems for uh, the Taiwanese government uh, and accusations that it was reacting callously uh, because spouses and children uh, of Chinese nationality were not initially allowed to come to Taiwan. Now, you dig a little bit, the uh, business people who were involved uh, were also heavily involved with Chinese political warfare or supporting campaigns by politicians in Taiwan who were trying to win the presidency against, against Taiwan. So the, all these point to uh, machinations by the Chinese Communist Party uh, to cause controversies for Taiwan. A more recent one was a facial mask manufacturer in China, uh, in Taiwan, who uh, imported uh, material for uh, face mask manufacturing from China. Uh, and he knew full well that the material was inadequate and it would not pass the, the, the tests by the Chinese government. Uh, but he obviously was disgruntled and, and basically wanted to punish the Taiwanese government by possibly causing a, a domestic flare up in, uh, in outbreaks. Uh, and consciously uh, writing that he wanted, he hates the government and he wants to cause trouble by importing these deficient masks and all that. Uh, disinformation, we have seen imagery, uh, disinformation that uh, alleged that a lot more people had died than the seven people who have died in Taiwan of COVID-19. Uh, and they claimed that they had uncovered areas where there were mass graves uh, in Taiwan, where the Taiwanese government was trying to hide people who had died from COVID-19. Very quickly, that was debunked and it was proven that some of the imagery actually came from Hollywood movies. Uh, but again, if you trace back the origin, uh, it was found that those that initially emerged on social media in China and then were picked up by traditional and non-traditional media in Taiwan uh, to amplify uh, the message and try to undermine support for the Taiwanese government. Uh, so far, we've been very lucky. The government here has responded adequately to that threat, uh, and we have not seen uh, any indications that uh, public trust in government institutions has been eroded as a, as a result. So again, this speaks to resilience, this speaks to awareness, uh, and Taiwan being exposed to that threat for decades uh, has proven time and again that it has the means to combat these disinformation efforts uh, coming from China.
Thank you very much. Now I would like to bring the Latvian voice back into the conversation. Professor Struts, uh, we just have heard uh, of, of both Invidis and Michael's presentation that there are some commonalities indeed in these tactics, such as exacerbation of societal divides along ethnic, linguistic, class, value lines. It's some speaking to the nostalgia of, of, of certain members of the society. There's um, it, also one of the tactics is to undermine both the local identities as well as what can be seen as Western values. And everyday activities are being weaponized, speaks to something that speaks to your argument about interdependence. So there's trade, tourism, overseas community members, and also the element of asymmetry uh, shines through quite strongly. Now, my question to you is, uh, is there room for cooperation and uh, how do we increase resilience along those lines? It's 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 a tough question. Sorry, you can take it whichever whichever way you want to. <laughs> uh, indeed, this is a uh, it is a good and tough question at the same time. Absolutely, I think that we we indicated quite a number of those uh, challenges we are facing as open, interdependent, and I would still say small societies because of course. A smallness can be measured in different ways, also with regard to our neighbors. And if we uh, have the sort of measurement with regard to our neighbors, of course, then exactly the word what you just mentioned, asymmetry is coming into the sort of equation. Uh, as for the uh, as for the um, um, the threats, yes, absolutely. I think there is or challenges. There is a there are a lot of those challenges. There is a, there is a spectrum of uh, different issues we are facing. Even though there are specific uh, uh, challenges for each of our societies, same time I think we we indicate some commonalities. Commonalities which actually come out of exactly the issue that we are open. We are uh, democratic. We are society is still in a transition, still in adaptation, still in an adjustment. And of course, in the process, uh, you always can face some sort of uh, threats and challenges also from inside, but also from outside. The key to the um, key to those challenges, I think the word of resilience was mentioned. Uh, and you also raised the issue of resilience uh, and also there were distinguished speakers mentioned about resilience. Of course, resilience is also a bit of tricky, tricky concept. What exactly it means, what exactly it includes. It is a catchphrase for the moment. Um, it is a, um, a word which is being used by the NATO, by European Union, also within our own societies. But exactly what are the trade-offs in this uh, sort of process of finding for resilience? Because on the one hand, you still want to keep our societies open, uh, liberal, democratic, but at the same time, of course, you want to protect exactly those values. So this is not a, this is not an easy, easy question. I think uh, one of the good ideas uh, was even mentioned by Joe Biden, some sort of democratic alliance. But those societies, uh, those uh, states, those countries which are united by the same values uh, and they share the same values, I think it is important also to cooperate more extensively in a in a process of uh, disinformation or against disinformation, in a um, in a consolidation of societies, in energy security. Also in the Baltic countries, I think it is extremely important issue as well. So there are a number of directions we can cooperate among ourselves, but at the same time, I think there are no easy responses to this. At the very end, even though we share many things, at the same time, each uh, society has its own uh, specifics of development and also sort of building resilience. Indeed. Um, so my uh, next question is um, regarding the um, uh, the, the, the to, to, to bring it back into the cyber realm and I completely agree with with Vida that it is indeed just one of the one of the aspects and it's much wider than that. Um, I would like to ask what is the um, uh, what is the the position and the experience of uh, the societies in Lithuania and Taiwan uh, regarding uh, strategic investments. So, for example, when it comes to strategic investments in the sectors that uh, trade in information and that trade in high tech, um, something that we'd also mentioned, right? Um, 
has there been um, an understanding that it's not just the traditional sectors, right, such as energy, that um, are are at the front lines of our society, so to speak, and, and to that you know contribute that can contribute to the resilience or 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 can undermine the resilience of our societies. What is the current debate? What are these sectors that are being considered to be um, on these front lines? And where do you see this is going? Thank you. Please, Vida, let's start with you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Una. Well, I probably wouldn't be able to give exactly like, well, the, the line of the argument, the, the public debate, but there is awareness indeed that these new technologies would would make like well is a sensitive sector right and it has been pointed out in the in the threat assessments as well that the new incoming technologies is something that we have to be well at pay attention to and we have to uh, uh, to take uh, well to be cautious about but generally talking about the investment in Lithuania I would say that ever since the well ever since the independence Lithuania is probably more sensitive than other countries than let's say western european countries have been to foreign investment because there is there has always been this well suspicion on the in, like uh, regarding the incoming investment and definitely this this goes further on to to the new technologies to to the new sectors and i would say that probably this awareness is pretty high relatively high maybe higher than than elsewhere that we would expect so i would i would say that we are we might be a little bit well safer than because just because of the historical experience and everything because lithuania that's what, what it has been doing for a very long time trying to protect itself because this threat it's not a new thing like these, well, hybrid threats. When I said, well, go beyond cybersecurity, these threats have always been here since the independence and in, in like, well, after 1990. And this, this, like, this is still here. So that's very, very short answer, but definitely that's, that's the conclusion, kind of. Thank you very much. And indeed, you have outlined this, uh, the, the comparative advantage that we share in the Baltics is that we kind of, you know, with, with the frog leaping, uh, sometimes we are ahead, right? We adapt uh, to the challenges sometimes more quickly because of our experiences. So this comparative advantage is also something I think it is a field for learning. Uh, Michael, please. Sure, thank you. Well, uh, on cyber, particularly, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my in my brief uh, remarks, uh, Taiwan has been exposed to cyber warfare from the Chinese for a good number of years, uh, both its government sector, but also uh, private industry and targeted uh, sectors of the industry that are of interest to the Chinese. Uh, so a bit like the Baltics, uh, that decades long experience uh, probably contributes to more awareness and dare I use the term resilience again. Uh, and these are experiences that Taiwan uh, certainly can share with partners, like-minded partners uh, globally. To your question more specifically, uh, the new challenges in, in high-tech sector and all that, well, certainly one area that is uh, much talk about nowadays is uh, supply chain uh, and diversification and decoupling uh, from authoritarian revision, revisionists like uh, like China. Uh, Taiwan is at the very center of that uh, initiative uh, by virtue of the fact that it is a key player in the computer chip manufacturing, far more advanced than anything that the Chinese can produce nowadays for 5G, for cell phones, for computers, for artificial intelligence. Uh, the growing awareness globally uh, of the challenges that China poses to our democratic institutions has compelled governments, uh, think tanks, universities and societies uh, to reevaluate the value of Taiwan as a partner in that initiative. So there are lessons to be learned from Taiwan uh, in balancing uh, one's uh, democratic values with reliance on the Chinese economy, uh, but also to think of strategies for uh, computer manufacturers, uh, telco companies, uh, 5G manufacturers and all that uh, to form coalitions uh, where they work together and propose a non-authoritarian alternative to Huawei, for example. Uh, 
And I think that's an example that's quite relevant to everybody nowadays. Uh, but if you do not have the sufficient technological capability and, and knowledge uh, to come up with your own solutions, then China will, uh, will certainly prevail. So this has been a very good period for Taiwan where uh, reevaluation of its value uh, and acknowledgement that it is one of the key manufacturers of the very technologies that are needed to answer or to respond uh, to the threat posed by China uh, in the high-tech sector uh, is uh, quite beneficial to Taiwan. And uh, its handling of COVID-19 and the publicity that that had generated for Taiwan in recent months uh, has put Taiwan on the map. Uh, and we're seeing uh, a lot of very promising engagement with Taiwan in, the, in that very, uh, very area. Thank you. My next question goes to all of the speakers. And so just um, we see that as uh, fr from what you have presented, uh, we can broadly uh, put the countermeasures uh, against hybrid threats in three large baskets. The first would be the information countermeasures. This is where Stratcom comes in. This is the involvement of stakeholders. This is the international partnerships. So exchange of information, fighting misinformation via information. Uh, now, the second basket would be the economic one. This is where the investment screening mechanisms fall. This is where some of some, some elements to decoupling fall. And the third, the most problematic basket is the restrictive slash strategic basket. This is what Vida spoke about when she mentioned removing broadcasting rights for, for some of the, uh, or sorry, says Russian programming and also what's something that in the Baltics we've been, we've been uh, temporarily removing broadcasting rights um, for for Russia, for example, Russian content, right? So, and it is this third realm where the controversy plays out. It is the most slippery one as the freedoms versus security controversy comes in here. So just to quote Michael, if an action is not necessarily illegal, but certainly unethical, what do we do? So my question to all distinguished panelists is, how far is too far? What should the societies avoid in the responses against hybrid threats? Please, let's start with Andris. <laughs> Una, it's great that you made me a panelist. <laughs> uh, Apologies. Apologies. <laughs> that's, 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 that's nice. <laughs> uh, I'm abusing my privileges as the as the chair today. I Apologies. can see that you are you are you are uh, relocating panelists and including some of the additional panelists. <laughs> so it's great always to be mobilized. Uh, but anyway, so I think you 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 mentioned a, um, a couple of again important things, and I really enjoyed. Uh, those baskets you just mentioned, uh, namely the information basket, the uh, economic basket, and also the strategic basket. I would actually add additional baskets, so it's it also sort of one, once more uh, speaks to the sort of extensive nature of uh, hybridity and sort of hybrid uh, interaction, namely technology. I didn't just mention uh, technological domain, technological basket, cyber basket. 5G basket, I think these are important things which also sort of uh, will define also how we interact and how how resilient our societies are. So I think there could be even those additional baskets. As for coming back to strategic one, it's not an easy one. So I, I think I will actually be short and stop here. It's not an easy one, namely that uh, on the one hand, of course, uh, once more, you should protect your values. Uh, you should uh, sort of, of course, uh, strengthen uh, uh, let's say those values and those mechanisms and those principles your society is based upon and sometimes also by limiting exactly sort of uh, some outside influences which can undermine your values which can undermine this uh, sort of the strengths and consolidation of society at the same time i think there are two things one is that uh, once more we are democratic societies i think that resilience sort of also is that you are ready to be resilient against those sort of those outside external disinformation sort of activities and you can resist and you can sustain and uh, it's not a sort of challenging your uh, fundaments of society. So that's why I think that there is a one dilemma, an additional dilemma is that some of those countries outside, including China, 
uh, still you need to interact. I think Taiwan needs to interact with China. Also, the Baltic countries need to inter interact with China and with Russia as well. These are our neighbors. So these dilemmas in those strategic dimensions are not an easy one. So I think there, of course, is some limit how far you go in protecting and you need to protect. At the same time, also, there are some limits that you still are open to uh, different sort of uh, activities from outside. And at the same time, you're also open to interacting with, let's say, those players which are not always easy and not always sharing your values because the world is more complex uh, than we would like to have. Thank you very much for humoring me and answering my question, even, even though I mis mis misrepresented you just now. Uh, so according to what you said, basically it's a very interesting point is that interdependence is not necessarily a drawback. The fact that we are interdependent with these uh, big neighbors uh, actually uh, gives us some room, some maneuver here. And that is, I think it's, it's a very valid point and a very good takeaway. Now, uh, Vida, please to you, how far is too far? Well, that's definitely a question, a question without an answer, I would say, or well, in the sense that there's always this debate, even now when we have this pandemics, there is the same, the same problem, like how far is too far of restrictions? Like, well, some might say that, you know, limiting, limiting freedoms, like freedom of movement is too much, even if that's the health crisis. So that's that's the same problem with with limiting information like in this third basket that you said that was the same debate you know that's a free society why can't i watch the the programs that i want kind of like well a very basic question and on the one hand yes that's true on the other hand that's that's well we all understood that that was necessary at that time like especially like around 2014 around the ukraine crisis that was that was well uh, that was essential, but I would say that this problem goes, which I think I think Professor also mentioned that if we like, it goes back to another problem of this. Well, another basket information. How well the society is aware of that problem without educating, well, without society being um, society understanding of what the problem is. This will always be a this this uh, well this. Uh, issue of how like the, it will always be too far because the society will always say an educated society will always say that that's too far so probably this this should come in combination like why are those restrictions being placed why why do we need it that's that's indeed essential but there is no answer to the question unfortunately i i it's Definitely, that's the but but that goes all the way to the definition of the state, you know, like how far of states in intervention in the society is too too much, and that's that's the question that hasn't been solved. Indeed. Well, the way you framed it is good enough for me, and I believe it is a very good answer. Now, Michael, to you. Yeah. All right, I'll do my best. It is indeed a tricky question. Uh, on your third basket, uh, well, obviously everybody knows that you know, restrictions. Uh, by the government uh, can be a dangerous slippery slope if they are abused. So they, those should always be uh, extreme decisions uh, in extreme circumstances. Uh, and the problem as well is that what is regarded as facts today by one government uh, could tomorrow be regarded as disinformation by another government. Uh, so once you've opened that door, there's always a possibility that it will be politicized uh, and abused. So unless there is consensus within society, uh, that can be a very uh, problematic proposition indeed. Uh, now, what we have seen, particularly from Taiwan's experience, uh, is that you have oversight agencies. Here it's a National Communications Commission uh, that has, over the years, imposed fines on media, traditional and non-traditional, uh, for the willful uh, dissemination of, of fake news, of disinformation. Uh, what we have seen as well following long series of talks between the central government uh, and organizations like Facebook and Twitter and, and other social media uh, is a means by which uh, sites that have been identified as content farms or content mills uh, that are contributing to disinformation are either being flagged uh, on social media, or it's uh, downright impossible to share their content. 
uh, on Facebook, for example. So that was one way by which the government did not uh, close sites that were seen to be a uh, content farms supporting a foreign regime. Uh, they were able to continue to operate in, in some instances, but knowing full well that for the message to enter Taiwan's bloodstream, uh, it relies upon social media, then they made it impossible for that content to be shared on social media. So that's an interesting alternative that uh, seems to have paid uh, dividends. Uh, beyond that, we have also seen, and that's quite recent, that's from two weeks ago, uh, there was one TV station in Taiwan uh, that had repeatedly been fined for spreading this information, uh, that has a very cozy relationship with the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and over the years has oftentimes adopted a line that is pro-Chinese Communist Party. Uh, two weeks ago, that TV station, uh, its news outlet, uh, saw its license on cable television being, uh, being cancelled, uh, which caused quite a bit of controversy in Taiwan and raising the questions that you yourself uh, raised a few minutes ago. Uh, but I think in all this, uh, what's going to be very important is that governments cannot simply say, this is hybrid warfare, this is an external threat, this is disinformation, uh, this is fake news, trust us if we take action against the organization. Uh, there is a very serious need for public diplomacy, and that's a point that was made earlier. Uh, and for that particular element of hybrid warfare and other aspects of political warfare, I would say uh, that we need much better communication by the government uh, and think tanks and affiliated universities uh, to educate the public and to make their case with the public. Uh, and I think we have reached a point where if you want to make your case with the public, uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies will need to find ways to declassify their material so that that can be used uh, to make the government case uh, against, uh, against certain entities. Uh, and in doing so, finding ways to sanitize and obviously protect uh, your, your sources and means of collection because you do not want uh, to jeopardize those, but education, 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 uh, to raise awareness and to make your case are, uh, I would say, the uh, the next big challenge for, for any country uh, facing that threat. Thank you. And just to add a point for myself, which echoes the speakers just now, I think that if we talk about what is too far, I believe that victimizing communities, entire communities, is too far. So when we talk about uh, the inside men and women, the representatives of a certain community within the target country that are being weaponized and are used in one way or another to spread the agenda um, of, of the player, um, of this um, hybrid player. That is a very slippery road in my book. And I, I think this is where, because real lives are at stake here, and this is where we need to really rely on all of these methods that you just, all, all of you outlined, to make sure that we don't take it too far. And thank you very much. Now back to Professor, Professor Sprouts for, for the conclusion and to, for the introduction of Mr. Andy Chin, please. <laughs> uh, Una, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thanks uh, a lot. Um, uh, our appreciation to our distinguished speakers. I think excellent angles and I think also excellent, excellent conclusion. I, since I've already been made a panelist uh, and I'm a bit sort of changing my hat all the, all the time, <laughs> uh, it's not, it's not an easy sort of to make some kind of concluding remarks, but I, I think I would be very, very short. So uh, first of all, saying that of course there are a lot of challenges and I think you nicely put them into several baskets three baskets, four baskets, five baskets, uh, so it shows the uh, sort of extensiveness of those challenges and threats uh, we are all facing. But I think it's also the charm of uh, democratic societies to face those different challenges. And I think what Michael, uh, I really enjoyed, uh, expressed at the very end, education, 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 resilience is about education, first of all. It's about public diplomacy with your own public. It's about involving as many stakeholders as possible and explaining necessities. It's not by 
uh, it's not by vertical uh, top down approach building resilience it's about bottom up it's, it's about horizontal approaches and i think this uh, in your um, last very strategic and important uh, question also sort of um, uh, it was mentioned in re in responsive to that question exactly that this is a permanent process uh, and uh, it is involving as many stakeholders as possible so i really highly appreciate uh, insights by michael by vida i think very valuable also international perspective and once more it allows us to think about ourselves about how we proceed with education what are the angles uh, what is an important thing to uh, think about engaging society but above all it is about engaging society it is about a mutual hearts and minds sort of interaction within society uh, so thank you once more for these excellent uh, excellent um, excellent insights excellent thoughts and here of course i'm happy to give the floor to um, to ambassador to mr andy chin who is the head of taipei mission in uh, baltics including in latvia uh, who was also behind this initiative and i think it is an excellent initiative so mr chin the floor is yours to conclude so i'm the panelist give the floor to real concluding <laughs> concluding remarks uh, to the Mr. Chin, please. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank Leah for uh, successfully uh, organizing uh, uh, today's international conference. And also I thank all our speakers for your outstanding uh, observation and all these insights. And also uh, our online audience, I thank you for your participation. During the past two and a half years of my tenure in Baltic states, and I'm based here in Latvia, I personally witnessed and saw how the three Baltic states fast response to the hybrid threats and also the, that the, the high level in general, the high level social awareness of this threat and i think that they always we have some problems not only in the body three states also in taiwan that when we implement our policies when we are reacting to all these external challenges there must be some complexities and something that we haven't dealt with before particularly in terms of the some barriers of democracy and freedom of speech so uh, definitely we have something in common to share and we have uh, some uh, problems or some issues to be tackled. So I think uh, it was our mutual understanding and our mutual learning and sharing of our experiences. So and in the general, in the broader perspective, Taiwan is so willing to cooperate uh, with the three Baltic states not only because of our many similarities uh, in our geopolitical uh, situation in our history, but also that we are like-minded countries, particularly like-minded small democracies. And we share many various, so precious merits, uh, various which are the cornerstone of our bilateral exchanges, our relationship and our friendship. So uh, because of all this, Factors. Uh, we uh, we are so happy, and we cooperate with Leah to launch and to start today's uh, uh, today's international conference. We hope that uh, from this point, that this is a starting point for our further cooperation, and I think from the understanding, mutual understanding of our common problems, and particularly now we are undergoing some kind of uh, uh, strategies, yeah, to uh, contract and to contain such kind of disinformation and hybrid threats. So particularly at this moment, I think this is a good starting point for following our cooperation and following uh, to further uh, bring our uh, Taiwan and the three politics together. So uh, I really thank you for your cooperation. And I think that all of us, we have found out that they do have some uh, very interesting and inspiring ideas coming out from our discussion. So uh, I hope next year and we can expand our cooperation and uh, to uh, invite to incorporate more stakeholders to come in to join our discussion and to build up gradually a kind of common sense 
and then to provide what we have learned and what we have initiated to uh, the uh, some uh, responsible agencies for them to consider. So uh, I hope next year we will have uh, some uh, more comprehensive topics, of course, including the hybrid spread to, to discuss. So I thank you again, and also I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of my on behalf of my government and our people to thank the three Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Thank you for your support for Taiwan's meaningful participation in the international organizations, particularly in WHO. So, uh, and particularly in this front, in this uh, cyber threat, in the hybrid threat, in this front, we will have a more room for our further cooperation. So, I thank you again, and I hope that uh, uh, next year, we can have uh, even more opportunities uh, in different areas and to cooperate. And uh, lastly, I wish you all health and wish everybody Merry Christmas. Thank you. So I can just, of course, add thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And I can just add, of course, uh, Thank you for partnership. Thank you to distinguished uh, speakers for excellent insights, excellent contributions for uh, food for thought for certainly sort of uh, uh, next year continuation of our debates. <laughs> education is absolutely the centerpiece of our interaction, mutual education. And uh, of course, happy, happy New Year, Merry Christmas, and first of all, above all, to have a safe and healthy New Year. So thank you so much, and good luck. All right. Bye bye.